morning. So glad you're here this morning. If you'd like to, you can open your Bibles with me to the book of Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes won last time for some time. We uh, did try to summarize the book for you this morning. We spent quite a bit of time in Ecclesiastes. We started back in August, I think August 13th, and we said, if you knew that you were going to pass away on November 27th, if you knew you were going to die on November 27th, how would you live between now and then? And we are now 106 days closer to eternity, as that is tomorrow. So how have you lived for the last 106 days? So, the, like I said, the question to focus on this morning is, what do we learn from the book of Ecclesiastes as I try to summarize the book for you? What could you write in your Bible about the book of Ecclesiastes so that a year from now or two years from now, if you go back to the book of Ecclesiastes, this is what you would remember from, from the book. And uh, we'll come back to that question at the end. Ecclesiastes has been about living backward, and the backward we have in mind is chapter 12, verse 14, the last verse in the book. But before we read that, let me pray. Lord, I pray that you would stand in front of me while I'm in front of them, that you would talk over me while I talk to them. Lord, I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So the back word uh, that we have in mind, the end that we're living towards, is the final judgment. And it's Ecclesiastes is insistent that you are going to die, and that there needs to be some urgency in how you live. And so you're not just going to die, you're going to be judged. And so please live well now. So as I thought about what could I tell you about God this morning, what does... The Ecclesi what does the book of Ecclesiastes tell us about God? I thought about telling you that God is utterly in charge or that God is for your joy. Both of those things would be true. But the book of Ecclesiastes really insists that, I think, with the final verse, that God is going to judge us. And so we read in Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 14, for God will bring every deed into judgment with every secret thing, whether good or evil. That is the, that is the, back, that is the thing that we're living forward to. That is the judgment that we're, looking, that we're looking forward to, and so we're living towards that now. And this is coming sooner than we want to believe. So the book begins with, vanity of vanities, says the preacher, vanity of vanities, all is vanity. Those are the first words of the preacher. These are the last words of the preacher in chapter 12, verse 8. Vanity of vanity, says the preacher, all is vanity. That, of course, bookends the book, and it is all through the book. And the word vanity means it's going away fast. And we said your life is like a match. There is a beginning, there is a middle, and there is an end. But it goes quicker than you think it's going to go, and... It's unpredictable in how it goes. But your life goes quick. <laughs> Even if sometimes it goes longer than you think it's going to go. <laughs> Proverbs 31, 30, which is right across the page in my Bible, says that charm is deceptive and beauty is vain. Vain means going away quick. It means it's hard to hold on to. And he says this is what life is like. It goes away quick. There's a beginning, a middle, and an end. And it's hard to understand. It's hard to hold on to. God is, God's judgment is coming faster than we think. And, and it's, you know, will we be ready? So what we should do is we should surrender to God. And so this just kind of working from the back of the book uh, forwards, we, we read in chapter 12, verse 13, Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. So the best thing you can do is surrender to God. And because what, what is the alternative to surrendering to God? Because you're like, I don't want to surrender to God. I want to be in control of my life. Okay, well, what is the alternative? 
what else can you do other than surrender to God? So, in chapter, Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verse 13, we read, Consider the work of God. Who can make straight what he has made crooked? So if God has frustrated creation, how can you unfrustrate it? You're simply not God, and you simply can't, is the answer that the book of Ecclesiastes gives. So the quote I use to help us understand what it means to surrender to God you know, just know that he's in control and we are not, is from Lisa Turkhurst. And when she wrote this, um, she had just found out that her husband was having an affair. And she received in the mail, like in the season, while she's still in a puddle of grief, she receives in the mail her book on how to deal with rejection God's way. That she then has to proofread and send back to the editor. And so here she is in a puddle thinking about her husband's affair and reading what she wrote about rejection. And she writes this, but it was the timing that seemed so very confusing. Why would I be proofreading this when I'm just going through that? It was the timing that fed this intense awareness that no matter how well I plan things, okay, you read the yellow words with me, ready? No matter how well I plan things, I can't control them. How many of you like to plan things? I like to plan things, and I like to be in control of things. And you know what? No matter how well I plan things, I'm still not in control. This is the book of Ecclesiastes whispering to you or shouting at you, grabbing your throat, saying, you're not in control no matter how well you plan things. No matter how well I think I know the people in my life. Ready? It's your job to read the yellow words. No matter how well I know the people in my life, I can't control them. Can you control the people in your life? Can you make their choices for them? Can you decide for them? You can't. You've tried. It's just frustrating. No matter how well I follow the rules, do what's right, seek to obey God with my whole heart. Man, that describes so many of us. That's why you're here this morning. You follow the rules. You do what's right. You obey God with your whole heart. Ready to read the yellow words? I can't control my life. And you've tried. And Ecclesiastes is saying, you can't. You don't live in Eden. You don't live in heaven. You live in the messy middle where things are frustrating. This, this is the one that got me with the left hook. Ready to read the yellow words? I can't control God. Indeed, you can't. But you can surrender. And that's all you can do. Or you can be frustrated. And this is the beauty of surrender, that um, God makes everything beautiful in its time. And so the analogy we used was of the loom. And so we said, this is our view, where we really don't understand what God is doing, and this is sometimes all we can see. And this is God's view, and he is making it beautiful in his time. And the best thing we can do is we can surrender, and we can enjoy our lives, knowing that God is utterly, completely, wonderfully in control. And so surrender. Now, the opposite of surrender is chasing the wind, okay? So instead of surrendering and enjoying the life that God has given us, we can chase the wind. And the, the Ecclesiastes sometimes calls this striving after the wind. And the analogy we used for this was from the psychology of money. One of, one of the analogies we used is from Morgan Housel's The Psychology of Money. Not a Christian book, but um, a book about life and how people view money. Consider a rookie baseball player who earns half a million dollars a year. So this is from 2018. I'm sure they earn more than that now. But half a million dollars a year still sounds like a lot. He is, by any definition, rich. You know, if you're a 23-year-old male making half a million dollars a year, you're doing pretty well, I think. But say he plays on the same team as Mike Trout, who has a 12-year, $430 million contract. He feels dirt, stinking, poor compared to Mike Trout. 
By comparison, the rookie is broke. Comparison being the key word. That's the part I'm going to say is chasing the wind when we compare ourselves to other people. But then think about Mike Trout. That $36 million per year is an insane amount of money. But to make the list of the top 10 highest paid head fund, head fund, hedge fund managers in 2018, you need to earn at least 10 times what Mike Trout makes. $340 million in one year. That's who people like Mike Trout compare their incomes to. And the hedge fund manager who makes $340 million compares, that's the key word, that's chasing the wind, the comparing word, to the top five hedge fund managers who earn at least $770 million in 2018. Those top managers can look ahead or compare themselves to people like Warren Buffett, whose personal fortune increased by $3.5 billion in 2018. Comparing is chasing the wind. And Ecclesiastes pleads with us to stop doing it. So Morgan sums up the moral of the story in, the, in this chapter on comparison in the psychology of money and like, like trying to do better than your neighbor. He sums up the moral of the story with this. The hardest financial skill is, and then I'll tell you what that is in a second. It'll be the yellow words. But it's one of the most important. So what would you say is like the hardest financial skill, but it's the most important? I would have said budgeting. I would have said like staying out of debt. I would have said like saving money ahead of time before you need it. You know, I would have listed other things. He says the hardest financial skill, but the most important that you have to have. Stop comparing. You got to get the goalpost to stop moving or you'll never be content. You'll never have joy. You'll always be dissatisfied and empty and angry. And so Ecclesiastes, you know, it's kind of like Morgan has climbed to the top of the mountain, gathered all this fi financial knowledge about the psychology of money, and he finds the book of Ecclesiastes already there. Then I saw that all the toil and all skill and work comes from man's envy or comparison of his neighbor, this also is vanity and a striving after the wind. Because like a lot of us, though, we'd say, look, I am too spiritual to chase money. I'm way too spiritual for that. I'm never discontent. I'm just too spiritual. Well, another way to chase the wind is to chase wisdom, even though wisdom is a very, very good thing. If you think that you can know enough to control your life so you can go back to Eden or forward to heaven so that there's no frustration or complications, that your life runs smooth because you are so smart. This is what Ecclesiastes says about wisdom. And I applied my heart to know wisdom and to know madness and folly. And I perceived that this also was a striving after the wind because you can't make your life Eden and you can't make it heaven. It will be frustrating because you live between Eden and heaven. It's striving after the wind. For in much wisdom is much vexation, and he who increases knowledge increases sorrow. The, the more you know, the more questions you have. The more you learn about how life is, the more you grieve the way it is. Wisdom is not God. It cannot solve all your problems. Other people might worship pleasure and say, pleasure is probably the answer, well, I will just escape. And so he says, I said in my heart, come now, I will test you with pleasure. Enjoy yourself. So he gives himself fully to that, like only a king could. And then he says, but behold, this is also vanity. The thing about pleasure is you always wake up the next morning. The thing about pleasure is you always have to pay it off afterwards. The thing about pleasure is you always feel empty afterwards and kind of empty during it and a lot empty depending on what you're doing. The thing about pleasure is it never lasts. It always runs out and you always want something different and something more and something bigger and something better. And he says, that's not it. That's empty and madness and folly. So then he says, I'm going to give myself to work and I'm going to work harder than anyone else works and I'm going to make things permanent. I'm going to make gardens that stay beautiful forever. I'm going to make buildings that never fall down. I'm, and he, just, he gets in this manic mode. 
And then he says, and I consider all that my hands had done and all the toil that I expended in doing it. I built my empire. Then he says, and behold, all was vanity and a striving after the wind, and there was nothing to be gained under the sun. He's like, you know, every garden, no matter how beautiful, it will always go back to weeds. Every building, no matter how well I build it, will fall into disrepair. Everything I do will one day be forgotten. Ecclesiastes would stop and try to, try to make eye contact with us. Say, please stop chasing the wind. Life is too short. Waste your life chasing stuff that is going away. Please don't chase stuff that's going away. Okay, so, so if the right thing, you know, if Ecclesiastes says God will judge us, so what we should do is we should surrender. What we should not do is chase the wind. <laughs> as hard as it is not to chase the wind, we should stop doing it. Okay, then what should we do? Like, positively, what is the best way to live that Ecclesiastes would offer us? And I, I think Ecclesiastes says this is the best way to live. And I know that because we're going to read several cases where it says there is nothing better than to. Okay, but I'm going to try to summarize that with this sentence. Enjoy the grind by giving thanks. There's a lot there. Enjoy the grind by giving thanks. So Ecclesiastes would plead with you to not live in discontent, discontentment that chases the wind, that says, I need more, I need better, I need different, I need... Nope, stop the discontentedness. Please stop that and just enjoy the gifts that God has given you. Okay, please, please just enjoy the life that God has set in front of you. Now, it, you're going to enjoy the grind. So when Ecclesiastes talks about the grind... Talking about the daily grind, which mostly consists of eating, drinking, and toil. And it describes it. It just reminds me of one of these toys and the way it describes it. Because it, it says, you know, you go around and around and around and around and around and around, and it, there's a lot of noise and a lot of movement, and you end up kind of always doing the same things over and over and over and over again. It's kind of like how you go and you buy the same groceries every week to make the same meals every week in the same dishes that you have to wash the same, you, same way, same dishes, put them in the same spot so that you can get to the end of the week and go, now what should we eat this week? And you end up writing up the same grocery list that you did last week. And it just goes around and around and around and around and around and around. And, you know, you go to work on Monday, and you think, okay, five more days, and all of a sudden it's Friday, and you look forward to the weekend, and then it's Monday again, and, and you just go around and around and around and around and around. And Ecclesiastes says the key to enjoying life is not escaping that. Because there is no escaping it. The key is enjoying it by giving thanks for it. So let me, let me read this to you. I'm going to try to give you lots of evidence that the DNA for joy is gratitude. This is a sticky note that was given to me about mid-series, where someone said, I think this is what you're trying to say. And I heard a, a TV or radio preacher say the same thing. The DNA for joy is gratitude in the grind. In the round and around, same old stuff, grind. That's where joy comes from. Giving thanks for what God has given us in the grind. So ready? There is nothing better for a person than that he should eat and drink and find enjoyment in his toil. Do you see joy in the grind? Now where does that come from? This also I saw is from the hand of God, for apart from him, who can eat or who can have enjoyment? You see that we enjoy life by giving thanks for the grind that God has given us. Chapter 3, I perceive that there is nothing better for them than to be joyful and to do good as long as they live. 
also that everyone should eat and drink and take pleasure in all his toil. This is God's gift to man. Okay, let me call a timeout. I'm going to go, I'm going to get sidetracked just for a second. Did you notice the word pleasure up there? Remember how that was one of the things that was chasing after the wind, where he says, I'm going to give myself to pleasure? Remember that? Also, toil is one of the things that he said is chasing after the wind. And now he's saying that's part of the grind that you can take pleasure in and enjoy. Do you see that? It's because when you surrender that stuff to God, he gives it back to you to enjoy. But if you're trying to make that stuff God, it will only be frustrating. It can't be God for you. It can't give you enjoyment in itself. But if you surrender it to God, God will use it to give you joy. Okay, so back to my evidence collecting that you can enjoy the grind by giving thanks. Also in chapter 5, Behold, what I have seen to be good and fitting is to eat and drink and find enjoyment in all the toil with which one toils under the sun for the few days of his life that God has given him, for this is his lot. Everyone also to whom God has given wealth and possessions and power to enjoy them and to accept his lot and rejoice in his toil, this is the gift of God. Then in chapter 8, And I commend joy for a man as nothing better under the sun but to eat and drink and be joyful, for this will go with him in his toil through the days of his life that God has given him under the sun. Enjoy life. There's a lot more I could read in chapter 9, but I just picked this verse. Enjoy life with the wife whom you love all the days of your vain life that he has given you under the sun, because that is your portion in life and in your toil with which you toil under the sun. Look, look. You spend your life... Doing the same old thing over and over and over and over again. And I think a lot of times you feel like you're wasting your life because you're bored. And Ecclesiastes would plead with you to enjoy your life because this is God's gift. This is how you bring him glory as you enjoy the gifts that he has given you. The daily toil, your daily grind is his gift to you that you can enjoy for his glory. Don't be dissatisfied by it. Don't hate it. Don't dread it. Don't complain about it. Give thanks for it, for it is his gift. It is his kindness. We said, enjoy the grind by giving thanks rather than chasing the wind. And this is the result of surrender because God will judge us. But a lot of us, I think, probably never got past God will judge us. And here's the thing. Here's the thing about Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes raises questions that Jesus answers. And so the Apostle Paul is answering questions with Jesus that Ecclesiastes has raised. Okay, so Ecclesiastes raises the question God is going to judge all of us, He is going to bring out all of our secrets. We are all going to stand before the judgment seat of God. We're going to die. It's going to be too late to change. We're standing before God. And how is that going to go? And the Apostle Paul thinks, how did Jesus answer this question? And then he writes this at the end of 1 Corinthians 15, which is a long chapter on the resurrection and on our resurrection. And he writes, but give thank, but thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. See, if God will judge us, he will also give us victory over sin and death if, if, if we surrender to him. If he is our Lord and Savior. We do not have to fear death. We do not have to fear the judgment. Because he is our Lord and Savior and will give us the victory. And so we can live in thankful joy that he has conquered sin and the grave. Ecclesiastes raises the question, though, like, 
What about the judgment? And the answer is, well, Christ has conquered the judgment. But Ecclesiastes also raises the question, does anything we do matter? I mean, seriously, Ecclesiastes would describe us as glorious sandcastles that are returning to the beach. And if that's true, what does anything we do matter? How can a sandcastle gain anything because it's going back to the beach? The Apostle Paul is thinking about Jesus' answer to this, and he writes, Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor in the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is, can you finish it? Not in vain. Vanity of vanity, says the preacher, all is vanity and Paul would insist that in Christ Jesus, nothing you do for the Lord is in vain. Nothing you do for the Lord is in vain. You are storing up treasures in heaven. So do not grow weary. Remain steadfast. Enjoy the toil. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I pray that you would grab us by the heart and pull us close to you that we would enjoy the toil that you've set before us by giving thanks, by doing it with all our heart. Lord, I pray that we would toil for you and smile and give thanks for the salvation that you provide through Jesus, the crucified and resurrected King, and through your daily love that you provide for us through your Holy Spirit. Lord, I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.